The tort of negligence can seem very confusing. There are all these different elements and things you need to think about. But I have a really simple way that you can conceptually understand the tort of negligence. Okay, so right now, wherever you are, I just want you to close your eyes. Okay, you can still hear my voice and your eyes are closed. Cool. So I want you to imagine your walk to work or uni or wherever into your house, just somewhere you often walk so you're really familiar with this area. Okay. So you're just about to walk into the building, whatever building this is, and you're holding a whole bunch of stuff. So just imagine you're holding an antique vase and all just a whole bunch of stuff. Okay. And then someone comes running past you extremely fast and they accidentally bang into you. This bang causes you to drop your vase and it smashes on the ground as well as a few other things fall to the ground. Okay, so just visualize this and now think about it in regards to the elements of negligence. Okay, so the first element of negligence is duty of care. Basically what this means is, is the other person close enough to you so that they owe you a duty of care? Okay, so the person who just ran next to you and hit you was close to you, they literally touched you. So that's quite an easy one to say, yes, they are proximate to you. It's foreseeable that if they hit into you, you could um, drop something and be damaged or have your property damaged. Um, yeah, so that's obviously they could owe a duty of care to you. Whereas someone in Madagascar who you've never met, who you have nothing to do with, they're pretty far away from you. So they can't really owe you a duty of care unless there's some internet thing, but you know, let's just keep it simple. Okay, so in New Zealand, the duty of care, we basically go with this case, um, Anne's, and Mar and Borough Council, Anne's Borough Council. Um, so the Anne's test is Anne's one, which is, was it foreseeable and proximate? So that's just what I was talking about before. It's foreseeable that he'll hit into me, I'll drop stuff, and he was proximate to me because he literally touched me. But there are other ways you can be proximate. Um, you don't have to touch. So just think about, should they owe you a duty of care? Are they close enough that their actions somehow touched you? And the second part of the ANS principle is just thinking about policy. So let's say this was a firefighter and he was running to save a dying person in a building. Um, the courts might say, like, that's not really fair to owe a duty of care since this person was doing something for the public good. So you just want to think about these sort of things in ANS too. So that's the way the New Zealand's courts, the New Zealand courts basically do duty of care. But overall, according to Rolls-Royce, um, that case, and a few other cases, uh, the higher courts have said, overall, you look at whether it's fair just and reasonable to owe a duty of care. So you can establish something as fair, just and reasonable using the ANS 1 and the ANS 2. And that's usually how they do it. Just, is it fair? So just think about it yourself. Is it fair? Is a guy running next to you and smacking into you, is it fair that they wouldn't get um, held accountable? But would it be fair for the firefighter to be held accountable? So you just want to think of it like that. Okay, so now we've established element one, which is the duty of care, in relation to our little scenario. Okay, the second element you want to look at is have they breached their standard of care? So that's not a duty of care, that's basically, have they been idiots, to put it bluntly? So that guy running past you who smacked into you, um, was he negligent, like, in hitting you? Should a human being who's walking past you on a footpath that multiple people walk on its public footpath should they have more care should that type of person actually walk instead of sprint and be so careless so in our little scenario it's arguable that yes they did breach the standard because you would expect someone to walk a little bit carefully to not smack into other people so if this person is just running like a crazy person you um could say that they should have been more careful Okay, so that is the second element. Did they breach the standard of care? The third element is causation. So basically we're looking at, I was holding this vase, sorry, you were, 
when they hid into you and it dropped, did their action of negligence cause you to do the damage? Okay, so in this scenario, it's arguable they hit into us. Sorry, I won't say us. They hit into you, they caused you to drop it, so their direct action caused the damage. But let's say the person was walking and did hit into you, but at the same time, um, you had a seizure and actually fell to the ground and started shaking and you dropped your vase in that process. So even though they hit into you, they didn't actually cause you to fall and break your vase. So in that case, you would say there's no causation. So just think about it in fairness as well. It's really not fair for this person who didn't even cause your damage to pay for it. But if they directly caused it, then it is fair for them to pay for it. So always think fairness. Your fourth element is remoteness. So what that means is, was the damage I suffered too remote that it would be unfair to hold you accountable? So again, in our scenario, holding an antique vase, let's say it's an ancient Greek vase and it's like, I don't know, thousands of years old and it causes like three million dollars of damage. It's quite remote and when you're thinking about walking on a street you would never imagine or foresee that someone would just be carrying a vase like that so casually and that you could hit into someone and literally cause three million dollars worth of damage so it could be argued that that's too remote the damage is too unforeseeable the type of damage for you to be accountable um Whereas if it were, let's say, a normal $20 vase, I mean, you probably wouldn't be arguing it in court, but you could say, yeah, it's foreseeable that someone would hold something of $20 value. Or maybe an iPhone. Yeah, it's foreseeable that someone would have a $2,000 iPhone and that it would drop and break if I hit into them. So that arguably wouldn't be um, unreasonably foreseeable. That probably would be in this category. So that's the fourth element. In the fifth element and it's not really an element but kind of like heading the fifth thing you need to look at is defenses so that is um does the defendant have any defenses against you as the plaintiff so we're walking along with our vase did we also when they were hitting into us trip on a stone and break the vase but they did hit into us and cause it but we exasperated the issue by also falling. So you could say, they could say the defense of contributory negligence, which is like, hey, I was negligent, but so were you, and you also caused your own damage. So if they do prove contributory negligence, it doesn't mean that they're not gonna have to pay anything. It could just mean they pay 80% and you pay 20%. It depends how negligent you were. Okay, another defense is, if you were doing something illegal at the time, so let's say when we were walking, we were actually robbing a bank and stealing this huge vase from a bank. Um, and you're trying to rely on the time when you're doing that illegal action for this cause of action. It could be argued that this is ex terpia causa. Sorry, it's a long Latin thing. Um, so therefore, you can't rely on this action, which was illegal when you were doing it, to sue someone else. So that could be a defense. But do be careful because this might come up in exam questions, but it could be like a red herring, which is something that's trying to lead you down the wrong path. Basically, in an exam, you still want to lay out every one of these elements we're talking about. You don't just want to say, oh, it's illegal, so we're not going to look at it. Always go through it slowly. Another one, another defense, sorry, could be um, if you're voluntarily assuming risk. Let's say you're a boxer and you're in a ring and you get punched in the face. You can't say that they were negligent. I mean, you're putting yourself in this position and you're assuming risk. So I'm just going to read the Latin for you. That one is Valenti non fit injuria. Okay, cool. So those are the five things that you need to look at when you're answering a tort of negligence problem. Was the person close to you in some way? And is it unfair to hold them accountable from a policy reason? Do that with your duty of care. Two. Were their actions breaching a standard of care that they should owe you? Or should just owe in general? Like, were they idiots? Three, did their action cause you to have the damage? Or did something else cause the damage? Did them hitting into us 
cause us to drop it or did our own seizure cause us to drop it? Number four is remoteness. Was the damage that they did to you foreseeable? Again, would it be ridiculous to hold someone accountable for some sort of damage? And one thing to watch for this is if the type of damage is foreseeable, the extent doesn't matter. And number five is, do they have any defenses? Does the defendant have any defenses against this? Okay, so that is understanding the tort of negligence from a conceptual point of view, it's an overview. We can go into more depth in later videos. Um, so if you'd like to see that, write it in the comments. If you like this video, please like and please subscribe to my channel for more law videos or videos about studying in general. Uh, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye.